Welcome everyone to the October virtual book party. We are glad to have you join us. And um, if this is your first time joining us, we try to get through as many books as possible in the half hour or so that we have with you. We have five different library staff members who will be book talking for you this evening. My name is Catherine and I will be the host this evening, which basically means I am a glorified timekeeper, which is the best job here because I get to get lots of great book recommendations. And we will start by introducing our library folks who are going to be talking uh, with you this evening. So Allison, if you'd like to start. Muted, 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 muted. <laughs> Hi, I'm Allison Cochran, and I am an adult advisory librarian at various libraries in the district. I think I'm next. Uh, my name is Chelsea. I'm a reference librarian, and I also hang out at all of the libraries. I'm Kara, and I'm on the events team here at the library, so also at all the libraries. And I'm Lauren, the another adult advisory librarian and do a lot of book clubs. So that's kind of the focus of the books I, I read and talk about. Hey, and I'm Ted. I'm one of the youth librarians and I also work all across the district. Excellent. Thank you all. So we will jump right into our book talks. Okay, so this is Cloud Cuckoo Land by Anthony Dower. And I Everyone has been waiting a long time for a new book from this author since his huge hit with all the light we can't see. I'm at a bit of a loss to describe this book, so I'm going to use a quote from the publisher for part of this. In the besieged city of Constantinople in 1453, in a public library in Lakeport, Idaho today, and on a spaceship bound for a distant exoplanet decades from now, an ancient Greek play provides solace and the most profound human connection to characters in peril. Um, I'll give you a warning. It's a long book and it's a complicated one. It jumps back and forth between all those characters and the Greek play. Um, so if that's not your thing, you might not like this book. But if you're willing to put in the effort to sort out the storylines, you'll be amazed by these characters and all these characters and really all of humanity's connections through stories over time. I loved it once I figured it out. Sorry, muted, that's me. So The Black God's Drums by P. Jelly Clark is an alternate history set in New Orleans post-American Civil War. The story follows Creeper, who is a scrappy wall-climbing street kid, as she tries to escape the world of the streets onto an airship by earning the captain's trust with information about a Haitian scientist and a weapon called the Black God's Drums. However, Creeper also has Oya, the Yoruba Arusha of Wind and Storms, who might have ulterior motives speaking to her while she and the captain work to stop the Black God's drums being unleashed on New Orleans. Uh, this is a real quick read. It, it punches hard. Um, I would recommend the Black God's drums to folks looking for a quick read, a punchy read, and one with an interest in Afrofuturism with some fine notes of steampunk. Firekeeper's Daughter is a debut YA thriller by Native American author Angeline Bowie. Um, the author will actually be visiting us virtually on November 12th, so if that's something you're interested in attending, please sign up. Um, this book has been getting a lot of buzz. It was recently named on Time's list of the 100 best YA books of all time, and it's about 18-year-old Donis Fontaine, who is biracial, so she's white on her mother's side and Ojibwe on her father's side. Um, it's also been optioned for a Netflix TV show. If that's something you're interested in, you can read the book before that comes out. Um, so Donis was supposed to go to college, but unfortunately there was a tragedy in her family. So she decides to stay home for a year and help her mom out. And during this gap year, she meets Jamie, who has joined her brother's hockey team recently. Um, he's very attractive and she begins to kind of fall for him. So they start hanging out. And one night they end up going to a party where they witness a shocking murder. Shortly after that, Jamie confesses to Donis that he's actually an undercover cop, and he convinces her 
to help him, him and his partner by going undercover to investigate um, this new strain of meth that's kind of been circling around the reservation. So Donis reluctantly agrees and kind of launches her own investigation using her knowledge of natural medicine from the Ojibwe culture that has been passed down to her by her family. Um, and pretty soon she begins to put the clues together and find out that someone she knows may be involved. So she has to decide um, how far is she willing to go down this road. And Kara, that's just such a pretty book cover. It's just it so intriguing to see the book cover. It's so, very pretty. Yeah. It's, thank you. I think my book is next, uh, The Color of Air by Gail Tsukiyama. She was born in San Francisco to a Chinese mother from Hong Kong and a Japanese father from Hawaii. And most of Tsukiyama's books are set in China or Japan, but this one is set in Hilo, Hawaii in 1935. It, it, it occurs during the actual event of Mauna Loa's eruption, the volcano's eruption. So the story alternates between decades past uh, when the characters were young and then what has happened since to bring them all back together again in 1935. Daniel went to the mainland to become a doctor. His uncle Koji stayed in Hilo to cut sugarcane. Nori opened the Okawa fish market, which became uh, the community gathering place. And the memory of a woman, Mariko, hovers over everyone. As I read, I was frequently surprised when I remembered that the events were taking place over 80 years ago. It's really fresh and a very lovely story of how past events make us who we are today and with and what results what results from that um, it's a very good book for book clubs and as are most of the author's books so this is the color of air by gail tsukiyama another another pretty cover actually i don't know if bunny has the prettiest cover but i like bunny's cover the best so this is Bunny by Mona Awad. And if you are a fan of um, Dark Academia or if you loved Heathers, this would be a great one to pick up. It's about a girl named Samantha who's just get graduated from um, college and she is essentially driven, she's just kind of aimless. And on a whim, she applies to the most prestigious writing program in New England. She doesn't think she'll actually get in, which is why she's shocked when they accept her letter. And she winds up as one of the only five women in this writing cohort at this extremely prestigious program. Now, Mona is a bit of, Mona, Samantha is a bit of an outsider. She doesn't really click well with everyone. She got there on a scholarship. She doesn't really know how to relate to all of the, all of her um, fellow students who are all unbearably twee and prim and bubbly and bright. And the reason it's called Bunny is because they all call each other Bunny. Now, it takes a bit of a dark turn because as Samantha is kind of drawn closer into their orbit, she had watched them kind of from the side and thought that they were just a little unusually close, like they were almost a high find. It turns out that the bunnies may or may not be involved in a ritual cult, ritual sacrifice cult. So Samantha is drawn closer into their world and also has to try to find a way out of her increasing bunification. So yeah, if you like um, dark academia or things that are really surprising and unusual and also a bit dark and also a bit bloody, that would be a great one to pick up. Okay, this is Miss Eliza's Kitchen, English Kitchen by Annabelle Ebbs. It's historical fiction and it's about a real person. Eliza Acton lived in England in the early 1800s. She starts cooking for when her family runs into some financial problems. So she becomes, rather than have a cook, she becomes the family cook. Not to say their family financial problems were that bad because she still had a kitchen maid to help her in the kitchen with that. And she and that maid end up spending many, many years creating a multi-volume cookbook. And cookbooks up to that point had been people's rambling things about, then add in some paprika. I liked, you know, and just vague comments. She really organized her cookbook thinking, People really need to have a list of the ingredients and the amounts of each, and then a description with some, then step-by-step -step instructions with some description. It doesn't seem shocking. That's how every cookbook's organized today, but she was the first one to do that. 
The kitchen maid in this is also a great character. She was a very poor girl. She became um, the scullery maid and the kitchen maid that eventually becomes a cook who has an extraordinary palate. Um, it's a great story about female friendship and creativity in addition to being wonderful about food and cooking. Okay, the ice pick surgeon. Murder, fraud, sabotage, piracy, and other dastardly deeds perpetrated in the name of science. It's a really long title. Um, it's by Sam King, uh, Keen, excuse me, and it gets into the nitty gritty of scientific and medical exploration, and um, most of it's not cute. So my favorite is piracy in the name of biology, as a lot of world exploration and trade was happening. Scientists were like, hey, I could go to this part of the world. There are bugs there that have not been drawn by folks, gentlemen scientists from the Western world. Um, so leave you at that, piracy and biology. Uh, this is both a fun and at times it's a bit revolting. So if you're squeamish, maybe try something else or read with caution. And the chapters read like standalone essays. So they do build on each other. I would recommend this book to fans of Malcolm Gladwell's books and fans of medical or true crime podcasts. Between Two Kingdoms by Suleika Jayode is a memoir about a woman whose life is interrupted by illness, recovery, and being forced to face her own mortality. So at 22 years old, Suleika graduates college and about 11 months later is slapped with a cancer diagnosis. She has leukemia with only about a 35% chance of survival. So unfortunately, she's forced to give up her apartment, all of her job prospects and her independence to move back home with her parents and face a grueling round of chemo and grueling more rounds of chemo after that. Um, so while she's going through this treatment, she begins writing a column for the New York Times chronicling her journey and a lot of people in similar situations write to her. Um, she also meets a lot of other people with cancer diagnoses. Some of them are younger than her, some are older, some make it and some don't. Um, and after four years of this grueling chemotherapy treatment, she finally, her cancer goes into remission and she's kind of, you know, she's healed physically, but mentally she spent so long thinking about dying. She doesn't really know what it's like to live. So she decides to go on, on a road trip and meet some of the people that have written to her along the way including a teacher that lost her son to cancer, um, a prison inmate that's sitting on death row, and many other people. And so along the way, she kind of discovers who she is and begins the healing process after this traumatic event. <clears throat> ah, Finley Donovan is Killing It by Ellie Casamano. Uh, Finley, the main character, is a writer, the mother of two young children and recently divorced. She also can't come up with the plot of her second book and her ex-husband is cutting her off financially. When she meets her agent at a coffee shop to assure her that she is writing the second book, which she's not, a woman nearby hears Finley talking about the character that she's supposedly writing about, a contract killer. Um, this strange woman sitting nearby, the stranger, assumes that Finley is describing herself. So she contacts Finley with a job. Please get rid of my horrible ex-husband. Finley, with the help of her children's nanny, is tempted by the money that this woman is offering to get rid of her ex. She needs the money to pay back her advance and never mind just to live. But Finley and her nanny pretty soon realize that real life crime is much harder than writing about it. So this is fast paced, funny, and the first in a series about stressed out Finley Donovan. The second book is called um, Finley Donovan Knocks Some Dead, and it should be published. It should be out next year. So this is fun. I'm still muted. So this is The Vegetarian by Hong Kang. And this uh, won the uh, Man Booker in 2014, I think, but I missed it when it came out. So I was delighted to get to read it recently. And it's about a woman named, sorry about that. And it's about a woman named Yang He, who is essentially um, shooting for the 
easiest or the path of least resistance. She marries a man that she doesn't really care very strongly about. She has a job that she doesn't really care very deeply about. And she and her husband sort of just kind of drift along. She kind of just um, feels like everything is fine right up until the point when she has a dream. Uh, her husband, the story is told uh, from three different points of view, from her husband, her brother-in-law, and from her sister. Her husband comes down uh, stairs one night after hearing her rooting around in the kitchen, and he finds her with all of their meat, all of their animal products, strewn around her in a um, circle as she's kind of going over all of it, and he says, what are you doing? She says, I've had a dream. She cannot get the idea of blood out of her mouth, so she decides to essentially go vegetarian on the spot, and she forces her husband into vegetarianism as well. Now, that might sound like um, it actually takes a really grim and strange turn as everyone in her life essentially tries to control her and force her into readopting meat. So that is a vegetarian. Um, would very highly recommend it for anyone. Hey, this is Silent Winds, Dry Seas by Vunit Bouchit. Um, it's literary fiction and from a debut author. So I actually have the one with the most beautiful cover, which is why I picked this book up, just out of curiosity. Um, and I love fiction that teaches me about another place or time. And I read the description of this and thought, I know nothing about Mauritius. Do any of you? I, I don't know. For those of you who are ignorant like myself, it is a small island near Madagascar that was a former British colony and they brought in many people from India to work on plantations there. So the, popu the current population is a small part British, the original African indigenous people, but primarily Indian, pop even though it's actually pretty far from India. Um, and in this book, a young man who grew up in Mauritius and then went as it was an English colony, went to England for his education and is now working in a university in the United States, um, returns to Mauritius to visit his dying father, and he recalls his early life on the planet, on the planet, on the island, sorry, didn't read that right, um, in this very lyrical, poetic book in which I just so enjoyed being immersed in a place I knew nothing about. I also picked this up for the cover, but because it's silly. Um, so, Easy Crafts for the Insane, a mostly funny memoir of mental illness and making things by Kelly Williams Brown. Uh, she is of adulting fame. If you saw the book, Adulting, that's her. Um, she recounts um, her 700 bad days. Uh, to be clear, this is not a craft book. Uh, it is a memoir with some craft. So it's a bonus there. Uh, Brown pits her experiences with depression, divorce, inpatient treatment, and several broken limbs, all unrelated, um, against the guiding power of crafting. This memoir does discuss mental illness and self-harm, but it does so in a way which acknowledges the larger systems at work in addition to the secondary harm uh, that mental illness can cause. So it's it felt very fresh in its take on mental illness and, and her personal dialogue with it. I would recommend Easy Crafts for fans of dark humor and memoirs. Bonus if you want to follow along with some of those uh, Easy Crafts as pictured on the cover. Daisy Jones and the Six is a contemporary novel by Taylor Jenkins Reid. This author will also be visiting us on December 9th virtually, um, so be sure to sign up for that. She's going to be talking about Malibu Rising, um, but be sure to sign up for that when registration opens. So this book is loosely based on Fleetwood Mac and the music scene of the 1970s, which I'm a huge fan of. Um, and it's about Daisy Jones, who's kind of this enigmatic, mysterious, up, young and upcoming singer. She's got a lot of raw talent. And then there's a band known as The Six. Their frontman's name is Billy Dunn. And their producer decides, let's put them together because they're both kind of up and coming and very talented and see what happens, have them make an album. So immediately there are sparks between Daisy and Billy. 
But Billy's girlfriend, who's on the road with them, has recently found out she's pregnant. So this also causes a lot of tension, um, along with all the sex and drugs and rock and roll kind of happening in the music industry of this time. Um, as the band is rising to fame quickly, they fall just as fast. Um, and it's told kind of in these in this Rolling Stone style of interviews, which is very interesting, especially the audiobook version. It's a full cast of characters. And um, by the end of the novel, there's kind of this twist ending. We find out who the person interviewing them is, which is interesting. And it's kind of the characters looking back and reflecting on their music career. They're older now and they're reflecting back on their music career and what led them to where they are today. Yes, Kara, I really enjoyed it too. Even in the book, you can get the sense of the different characters' voices, just even just reading it. I thought it was really well done. Ah, Miracle Country is a memoir. Um, and I sometimes think that memoirs are more interesting for the person that wrote them than for others. But both Kara's memoir and Chelsea, that Chelsea's that she just talked about sound really interesting. And this one is too. Um, so Kendra Atley work, um, it, this is a story of her growing up as memoirs often are. She is still young in her thirties. She uh, growing up, she and her family lived in Swall Meadows in the Eastern Sierra Nevadas, which is basically a desert and an area plagued by wildfire, wild fires. Her family thrived in these harsh conditions, however, but they were very close family, but then her mother died uh, when she was 16 and the family kind of scattered. Um, after college and working elsewhere, Kendra realized that she had to come back home to that part of California. Uh, so it's the story of finding one's place. Um, as the author's friend said, you're lucky to know your direction home. Um, it's a time, also a very timely examination of California's historical, historic environmental policies. And of course, California's ongoing drought and the effects of those which are very apparent today, this past summer, the past couple of years. So it's it's really interesting personal story and that has wider interest. So thank you. So this is Madame by uh, Phoebe Wynn. And if you love the Gothic or if you love uh, Victorian uh, mysteries, but would like to see it kind of updated a little bit, this would be a perfect one to pick up. It's about a young school teacher named Alice who majored in the, or has been teaching the classics at a very small uh, public school in England when she gets the surprising and shocking uh, offer of a lifetime. Um, at the age of 26, she is offered the a teaching spot at Calvadorn Hall, which is a 150-year-old, extraordinarily prestigious and extraordinarily exclusive um, school in the Highlands of Scotland. Now, Alice is a little, um, Alice is a little intimidated. She really does not necessarily want to take the position, but her ailing mother and financial necessity and also professional um, just what a professional opportunity is, convince her to go. And when she's there, she starts noticing things unraveling quickly. It's not just, of course, fitting in a new place, especially in a new place that is almost exclusively attended by the, I should have mentioned it's an all girls school and it's exclusively attended by the uh, daughters of the most powerful and wealthy families in England. To make matters even worse, she comes to suspect that her uh, predecessor's retirement was not necessarily natural. Um, so there's a bit of a mystery there. And again, if you enjoy Gothic uh, mysteries, but want them a little bit more updated, this one's set in the early 90s. And it was a really uh, fun read for anyone who enjoys things like Crimson Peak or um, yeah, any Gothic mystery. Okay, so Chuck's not here tonight, so I'm doing a cookbook in his honor. Um, this is Chetna's 30-Minute Indian by Chetna Makan. Some of you might remember Chetna from one season of Great British Bake Off, but in addition to baking, she's also a really good cook. Um, I picked this up and then was inspired to look 
to see if we had an Indian grocery store nearby to get some of the ingredients. And we had four Indian grocery stores within three miles of my house. So off I went to get some of the ingredients. The recipes are fairly easy. You can see it's all supposed to be 30 minutes. Naturally, it took me longer than 30 minutes to make any of these things. But the recipes are easy and tasty. I recommend the paneer onion masala rolls. It also made me check out her YouTube channel and I made an easy lentil dal soup, which my daughter said was one of the best things I'd ever made. Um, so check it out. Thank you, Chetna. Alrighty, Motor Crush by Brandon Fletcher, Cameron Stewart, and Babs Tar is a fast-paced graphic novel series. Uh, this is the first in the series. And we follow Domino, who's one of the best racers, both professionally and in the brutal street bike races. Uh, they take some fantasy liberties with some elements of this. Uh, flirts that line with sci-fi fantasy. And it is placed in the beautiful Nova Honda, uh, which is the racing capital of the world. The story leads up to the World Grand Prix and is wildly complicated by the illegal street racing world, uh, some drama there, and Crush. Uh, which is a motor motorcycle enhancing drug. So uh, I would recommend this for fans of the like classic comic book style, uh, like your superheroes, but it has nothing to do with superheroes. Um, also fun for anybody who likes motorcycles. Matrix by Lauren Graff. I don't really like this cover. It's not representative of the book, but I did love the book. Um, it's historical fiction loosely based on the life of a real life poet that lived in the 12th century, Marie de France. Um, she lived in the court of Henry II and Eleanor of Aquitaine in England. And one day she falls out of favor with the queen and is sent off to be the prioress at this abbey that's kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Um, when she arrives, she finds that most of the nuns are pretty sick, everything's filthy, um, it's kind of run down. And so just with a lot of determination and hard work, she kind of turns things around and turns this abbey into a thriving community of women. Um, there are some bumps along the way. She's got a battle with the church hierarchy and uh, some other outside forces. Um, but what I really liked about this novel is there's not a, actually a lot of historical data available about Marie de France. So the author did an extensive amount of research about the time period and what life was like in the 12th century and um, read all of her poetry and kind of fabricated a life for this person that really existed, um, but that we don't really have a lot of info on. So I thought that was pretty fascinating. list um, by Sarah Nisha Adams. This um, is a lovely, this is just really fun, a delightful fiction, fiction story about books and the people who read them. It is set in a library near London, so you can see why I liked it. Um, Mukesh is a grandfather who misses the human companionship after his wife dies. He wants to connect with his very bright granddaughter, who's a big reader, so he brings her to their local library for the first time. He's thrilled and delighted to get a library card. Uh, he strikes up a friendship with the front desk clerk. Somewhat cranky teenager Alicia is working at the library for her summer job. She discovers a handwritten list of books in uh, the returned copy of To Kill a Mockingbird, and so she decides to read this list of books. When Mukesh asks her what he should read, she shares the list with him. And so begins this friendship between these two really disparate characters. Uh, the little mystery of who wrote the list and why, and why it's there in this book at the library is also neatly wrapped up at the end. So it's just a, it's just a lovely book about books. So this is Boys Run the Ride. If you love graphic novels or manga, this would be a great one to pick up. It is about a uh, boy named Rio who is just moving into high school, trying to keep his head down, trying to keep everyone away from him. And that is because Rio is trans and also closeted. So he can't dress the way that he wants at school. He can't 
he feels like he's extremely constricted. He can't really talk to any of his guy friends because as soon as they got into high school, they didn't want to hang out with him anymore. Um, Rio is also nursing an extreme crush on one of his friends. And to make matters worse, he's just been seated next to the strangest uh, classmate that he could have imagined. It is an extraordinarily tall um, boy named Jin who had been held back a year and has absolutely no shame about it. He seems to be the complete opposite of Rio. At first, Rio thinks that this is going to end extraordinarily poorly, but as he keeps getting closer and closer to Jin and opening it up, Jin suggests that they go ahead and forget about school and start their own fashion brand since he notices that Rio enjoys drawing. Um, so Rio has to kind of navigate his new life as an aspiring fashion brand entrepreneur and also deal with being closeted while trans at school. Um, this was, uh, this is excellent own voices manga. If you are a fan of graphic novels, you would definitely like it. Um, I think the uh, next two have already been published, but they haven't been translated into English yet. So we're still waiting for that, but that is Boys Run the Riot. Hey, this is Light from Uncommon Stars by Rika Aoki. Um, this is a fantasy book. Boy, did I pick some books that are really hard to describe this time. This book has got the main character is a violinist who's made a deal with the devil to recruit other top violinists, although we're never really sure what for. It's also the sec second main character is a runaway transgender girl who's a violin prodigy and might be the next to be recruited for the devil as well. It's got space aliens who were fleeing a galactic war and ended up on Earth and are running a donut shop. But it's not in a silly way that just adds a little whimsy to it, the things about the donut shop. And all these people come together in this exploration of food and music, motherhood, love, and especially they all become kind of a found family, just prepared to love all these characters. Okay, we're coming back down to earth. Uh, so Too Much Lip by Melissa Lukashenko is the story of Carrie Salter. Oh, and by Earth, I should mention Australia Earth, not the United States Earth. Um, and so Carrie Salter, who has spent her life avoiding her family, her hometown, and prison. Um, and she is now riding a stolen motorcycle, so thematic at this point, home to visit her dying pop. When she arrives, she has to navigate the relationships she left behind. She left home when she was 17. Um, and those relationships are with her newly devout mother, her heavy drinking brother, and a, since she's been gone, a, an anorexic teenage nephew. The family is ultimately pulled together, for better, worse, and everything in between, um, to avoid the development of the beloved river that is running through their hometown. This novel moves fast and it expects you to keep up. Uh, the writing is scrappy and the characters are scrappier. I, I love that dynamic. Um, so just buckle up and hold on. Uh, Lukashenko won the 2019 Miles Franklin Literary Award and was shortlisted for a whole bunch of other Australian uh, writing awards. Uh, she also has an excellent moth story hour. Root Magic is another debut novel by Eden Royce. It's historical fiction and it's also middle grade. It's set in South Carolina in the year 1963. And it's about twins, Jezebel and Jay, who have recently lost their grandmother. Um, what they didn't know is that their grandmother practiced root magic, AKA hoodoo, which is a form of African folk magic. Um, their mother has never told them about this. She doesn't practice it. She doesn't really want them practicing it. So it's kind of been held as a secret from them. Um, but their uncle decides to start teaching them how to do root magic. And also what they didn't know is their grandmother was the one that had been protecting the family from a lot of um, supernatural creatures from folklore, such as haints and boo hags and other creepy things, as well as protecting them from the racism and prejudice that exist at the time. So the siblings kind of have to learn how to lean on each other and fight back against these creepy creatures um, to protect the family and find the power within themselves and kind of um, find their family legacy. 
Um, I really like this story because if you like witches and magic and all things of that sort, this story relies a lot on Gola and Geechee culture, as well as hoodoo, which is, all, like I said, that form of African folk magic. Um, so it's an adorable book, a little bit spooky, but not too scary for this age group. Ah, why peacocks? My last title is a fun and true story of the author's adoption of three peacocks, Carl, Ethel, and Mr. Pickle. Sean Flynn is an investigative reporter and he and his family live on a small farm in North Carolina. A friend basically unloads these three peacocks on the Flynn family. So even if you don't normally read books about animals, everyone can immediately picture these gorgeous birds. There's Mr. Pickle on his chair. Uh, you can picture these beautiful birds and perhaps you wonder about them. Flynn writes about all of his animals a little bit, dogs, chicken, and pigs. But he, of course, highlights the family's escapades with their peacocks as they work to keep them happy and safe from the local wildlife. He uses his skills as a reporter to unearth some interesting stories of famous peacocks, including a Southern California community that is inhabited by a large family of them to this day. It's just an engaging book about these beautiful birds that I've truly enjoyed. Well, objectively, Mr. Pickle is the best name for a peacock. <laughs> but moving in the exact opposite direction, uh, this is Blue and Green. Uh, this is a graphic novel uh, by Ramsey. And if you enjoy, um, or if you liked Jacob Ladder, or if you like psychological horror, or it's um, horror where someone is deteriorating, this would be a great one to pick up. It's about a young artist or a young saxophonist named uh, Eric Dieter, whose mother has just passed away. Um, his mother owned one of the most prestigious jazz houses in Duluth, in Georgia, um, and there was uh, quite a bit of contention between him and his mother. It's never, it's never explicitly stated, but you get the impression that she was somewhat abusive. And when she dies, she is found clutching a single photograph in her hand. Now, Eric has grown up completely immersed in the world of jazz. He knows who every musician is. He actually freelances as a um, writing biographies of jazz musicians. And when his mother, it, before his mother is placed to rest, he gets the picture of this one musician that she is holding a picture of that he has no idea who it is. He goes snooping around to all of the different, his old uh, jazz haunts, and he has to kind of try to come to terms both with his own sort of failed ambitions and try to discover the, um, who this mysterious jazz musician is as his mental health deteriorates. The lines between reality and his uh, nightmarish alternate world become increasingly more blurred. Um, actually, if you liked Sandman um, or classic graphic novels um, from Neil Gaiman, you would actually probably like this one a lot. Um, the art style is very similar to those. So that is blue and green. All right, and that is, those are all of the books that we have this evening. Thank you all so much for joining us. I just wanted to put a quick plug in here at the end. Um, for you to join us for our December book party, which will be our final of the year, where we will have 13 librarians talking about their favorite books of the year. We will be extending that one out to a full hour because we're difficult to contain. So we all have a lot. <laughs> so that will be December 14th at 7 p.m. And the event has not published in on the website yet, but it should be soon. So look for that as soon as it is ready to go. And we are excited to have you join us. To all of our book talkers, thank you so much. Y'all did a great job this evening, and we hope you all have a great night.